In this mini lecture, we're going to talk about the magic of microwaves. My name is Adrian Porch. I'm a professor at Cardiff University and I work in the School of Engineering and I head up the Centre for High Frequency Engineering, where we undertake research in radio frequency, microwave and millimetre wave technologies. And some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today are some of the more unconventional applications of microwaves that may not immediately spring to mind. What I want to emphasize during this talk is how engineering generally figures in the grand scheme of things relative to pure subjects like physics, chemistry, and biology. And engineering takes the fundamental principles from these subjects and then allows us to apply them for real world applications. And hopefully you'll see by the end of the mini lecture how this, how this works in the context of what I'm doing. So I'm going to talk about waves in the context of microwaves. Now, they're not water waves, but water waves are a good way of visualizing waves more generally. And we are going to be talking about electromagnetic waves. And microwaves specifically are all around us. We're bathed in microwaves currently due to the radiation from our mobile phones, which uses microwaves as the carrier signal. 4G, for example, uses frequencies around about 2 gigahertz. And 5G will be higher frequency, but just, just you know, a few gigahertz or thereabouts, still a microwave frequency. And we've been bathed in microwaves before the, you know, the, the birth of modern technology. This is a picture of the uh, cosmic microwave background. And what you see here, this is a picture from the Kobe um, Cosmic Background Explorer Telescope. Um, this is radiation at 160 gigahertz. It's actually a millimeter wave frequency. And everything emits radiation based on its temperature. And the blackness of outer space is about three degrees above absolute zero. So it emits at 160 gigahertz or thereabouts. And these are fluctuations in temperature, looking back really to the primordial uh, universe. And these are the formations, the first structures, galaxies within the universe, tiny fluctuations in temperature, one of the most famous images in the Hall of Science. You could say that's been superseded recently in the last year or so by this picture. This is from the Event Horizon Telescope. But again, it's a, it's a radio microwave image, this time at 230 gigahertz, so it's more a millimeter wave image. And this is the black hole in M87. First time a black hole has been imaged in this way. Now, Microwaves in common with all electromagnetic waves carry energy. We know that EM waves carry energy because if we look at the Earth, what keeps the Earth at a, a nice constant temperature of around 20 degrees C is, of course, is the sun. So there's a huge amount of radiative energy coming from the sun in the form of electromagnetic waves. Most of it is in the visible part of the spectrum and then also in the infrared and then also in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. And the energy is actually locked into the electromagnetic fields of the wave. It's potential energy, but then it's converted into heat when that wave interacts with the surface of the Earth. So looking a little bit more closely at that in the context of microwaves, here we see a classical picture of an electromagnetic wave. The red part is the electric field. The blue part is the magnetic field. They both oscillate, but that's a traveling wave that also carries energy in the direction that you can see, which is perpendicular to that of both the electric and magnetic fields. That's actually called a transverse electromagnetic wave, or TEM for short. And the frequencies of microwaves, they run from about one gigahertz to 30 gigahertz. And respectively, that corresponds to free space wavelengths in air of 30 centimeters at one gigahertz down to one centimeter at 30 gigahertz. And what we're interested in is the interaction of those fields with, with stuff, materials. And specifically, we're going to look at the electric field interaction in this mini lecture. Now, a little bit of basic physics here, that if we have two charges, the top one is a positively charged particle, the bottom one is a negatively charged particle, and we expose those to an electric field that runs from the left to the right, as you can see there, that electric field will sweep the positive charge to the right, and will sweep the negative charge to the left through electrostatic forces. That's what an electric current is, the flow of charge. So we generate electric current by applying electric field, and that's done through a voltage. Now, 
What is that? What are the consequences of that for materials? This is a very high power electron microscope picture of some water molecules. Um, and water has this very nice property of being a polar molecule. In other words, the, the charge on the molecule is zero, but the charges are distributed through the molecule. So some parts of it are positively charged, some negatively charged. And you can do an experiment very simply with a charged balloon, which you can charge up just by rubbing it on some clothing. And then a very thin, narrow stream of water from a tap will be bent towards the balloon, irrespective of the charge on the balloon. And that's experimental evidence showing us that the water molecule is highly polar. Now, looking at that in a bit more detail, we know water is H2O. So we have the red oxygen uh, uh, atom at the top there and two hydrogens coming off at the bottom. And there's a bond angle in there, which is really important for making water a liquid at room temperature, because it's actually quite a light molecule. Compared to carbon dioxide, for example, it's a lot lighter by more than a factor of two. But of course, carbon dioxide is a gas because it's a linear molecule, whereas um, high, uh, water at room temperature is, is, is a liquid. So that bond angle is about 105 degrees. And then the different electro electrochemical properties of oxygen and hydrogen mean that the charges distribute themselves through that molecule, as we'll see in a minute. But the hydrogens become partly positively charged. The oxygen is partly negatively charged. So when we bring a negative charge up to a stream of water molecules, like I'm showing here, you see the hydrogen swing around to be attracted to the negative charge. And that's why the stream of water becomes bent. If we brought a positive charge up, then the oxygens would line up next to it. So again, it bends towards the charged particle that we bring next to the stream. So that's what it means in terms of the water molecule. You see the hydrogens are partially positively charged, the oxygen is partially negatively charged, but the total charge there is zero. Now, if we apply an electric field to that molecule, acting from left to right initially, then you can see that the positive charges on the bottom will move to the right, and the negative charge on the top will move to the left. But there'll be no translational force on the molecule because there's no net charge. And what we're describing here, of course, is a torque. So the molecule will spin, and in the direction of the field that you see there, it'll actually rotate in an anti-clockwise sense so that the positives line up with the direction of electric field. Now, if we reverse that field direction, then the opposite is true. The molecule will now rotate or spin in a, in a, in a clockwise sense, and that will cause then the, um, the positives to line up on the left. Now, if that electric field is oscillating, as it would do in an AC uh, sense, and of course, microwaves oscillate at gigahertz, which are billions of cycles per second, then those water molecules are going to be in continuous rotation. And what we know about water molecules that make water a liquid at room temperature is that they're bonded to each other by hydrogen bonds. So the friction that we get through this rotation in the context of this hydrogen bonding network is the thing that gives rise to heating when water is placed in the microwave oven. So that's how foodstuff heat. If we have dry foodstuffs, then you probably know that it's quite difficult to heat those in a microwave, but anything that's wet will, will very rapidly and readily heat. Now, where do we apply this? Well, one of the applications I'm going to mention first is in the uh, development of non-invasive blood glucose monitors for those with diabetes. Now, diabetes is a, is a, is a condition that currently affects at least 7% of the world's population, and that's rising. It's an enormous strain on public health resources. It leads to large degrees of death in the population through poor management of the condition, which leads to conditions like stroke, blindness, heart disease. And if you want to self-monitor your diabetes, then the traditional way is to use a blood prick test where you take blood and then you insert that onto a, onto a, onto a little strip and then you get a reading of your blood sugar level through the reading on the meter connected to the strip. We now also have continuous glucose monitoring sensors, but all of these are invasive in the, in the sense that they need access to blood. So what we're trying to develop is something called a non-invasive blood glucose monitor, where we, we don't need blood. The interaction is through active electromagnetic fields, and in this case, microwaves. And 
if we had such a product, we'd improve the quality of life with people with diabetes and hopefully through better management of their condition, will improve their life expectancy. Now, there's been a whole generation of uh, different blood glucose sensing devices going from the invasive blood prick type measurements, as you can see at the top there, through the middle section, which are the partially invasive ones, which are the continuous glucose meters, which again are electrochemical in origin and need access to blood. And then we have um, the next generation of sensors, um, which involve non-invasive methods. Some of these have been tried and failed. So many people have walked this path before, uh, but we have a solution involving microwaves that we're currently commercializing. We hope to get a, a sensor out there within the next couple of years. Now, the interaction here is very similar to what we just described for water with microwaves, because blood is mostly water. And the presence of glucose disrupts that hydrogen bonding network. So if we can measure the absorption of microwaves by, by blood, we can convert that into a blood glucose reading, and that's how a device works. We had some money off the Wellcome Trust to support this. Wellcome Trust support medical research in the UK. Um, and what we have is a little microwave circuit that you can see there schematically that fits to the body. And then on top of that, we put some electronics, a battery, and a transmitter. And then that sends a signal to a computer or a mobile phone and what we're looking at there is the power absorption of microwaves by the blood converted then into a blood glucose signal. It doesn't involve the extraction of blood at all. I hasten to add the microwave power level here is less than one milliwatt. That's way below the level that mobile phones emit. So there's no sensation of heating here. It's a very low grade absorption of microwaves that we're looking at. Here's one of the devices, the prototypes that we've developed. This is Dr. Hong Jae Che, one of our research fellows, wearing it. And that device um, communicates with the laptop computer that you can see on the desk there to give you a real-time measurement of the blood glucose value. Here are some of our results. This is called the Clark Error Grid. And vertically on these graphs, we plot our measured blood glucose measurement from the microwave sensor. And on the horizontal axis, we plot the blood glucose as measured by the gold standard, something called the Yellow String Springs Instrument uh, Blood Glucose Analyzer. So these results were taken through clinical trials where uh, a patient basically wears a cannula so we can take blood on tap and then we can compare the, the, the blood sugar levels with our sensor with that of the, um, of the lab instrument. Now, they should be on a straight line through the origin at 45 degree angle. Um, it's a one-to-one -one correlation. And you see there's a bit of fuzz in our data, but that's as good as the current commercial uh, continuous glucose monitors. So we, we think that this sensor has great promise and could indeed transform the lives of those people with diabetes. One other application which uses higher power microwaves now is again in the medical area, but before describing that, let's have a little look inside a microwave oven. And you can see there that the, the thing with Panasonic on the side of it is called the magnetron, and that's the microwave source in a microwave oven. It's a valve device. Because it's a valve device, it requires very, very high voltages, DC voltages. So below that, you notice the transformer, and the transformer takes mains voltage at 240 volts AC in the UK, and then steps it up to 5,000 volts DC. Now, this is highly dangerous, both in terms of the microwave power levels generated and indeed in terms of the very high voltage DC signals that we have in, in this structure. So one of the specialities of Cardiff is developing solid state means, silicon-based or gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, gallium nitride-based means of generating or amplifying microwave power. So we can replace the magnetron, which is, as you can see there is a high voltage, high power device, instead with a high power circuit that involves transistors that can amplify low grade microwave signals to similar power levels, but only require car battery type voltages of around a few tens of volts. They can currently deal with about 300 watts of microwave power. These are called silicon, silicon LDMOS transistors. And they're very small, they're postage stamp size. And of course, if we want one kilowatt, then we just have three of these type amplifiers. So they're easily scalable as well. 
So this lends itself to high power, safe, portable micro applications. And one of the applications that we're um, applying this technology to is, uh, is that of detecting bacteria. This is a specific bacteria called Clostridium difficile. And one of the major challenges facing healthcare in the 21st century is something called antibiotic resistance, where bacteria are becoming resistant to all known antibiotics. C. difficile is a nasty infection that causes many tens of thousands of deaths per year, and it, it's prevalent in hospitals and care homes. And it's an enormous drain on the economy with the associated healthcare costs. And of course, the mortality rates are tragic. The current detection methods lack sensitivity, specificity to the bacteria, and also they're very slow. They can take days for the result to be returned. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop a method whereby the DNA of this bacteria is released very rapidly so we can actually do a point of care detection so we can return a result within a minute rather than wait for days. And of course, because we're a microwave lab, we're shocking these bacteria with microwaves. And what we do is we expose them to a pulsed microwave that looks something like this. This is the electric field profile in the, in the microwave signal that we apply. And you remember that the microwaves are oscillating anyway at billions of cycles per second. So here we use two and a half gigahertz microwaves. That means that they are switching back and forth five billion times per second. And the pulses are only one millisecond long. So in each one millisecond pulse, the electric field switches about five million times. The pulses themselves are spaced by around 100 milliseconds. That's called a 1% duty cycle. And the reason why we pulse like this is that we don't want the bacteria in the, in the solution to boil because that will denature their DNA and that makes it useless for detection. So we want to retain the integrity of the DNA, the sequencing of the DNA, to allow us to detect it. So we don't have any heat in here. So we're, we're not heating, but we're still exposing the bacteria to very, very high electric field levels. Uh, just to give you some idea of the time scales here, the blink of an eye takes about 300 milliseconds. So we're pulsing at one millisecond. So they're very rapid pulses. And then we have a clever system that has been developed by our School of Pharmacy, headed up by Professor Les Bailey, and Les's group has developed this reporter mechanism based on uh, capturing the target DNA, which is the, the, the dark blue strand that you see there, through a, a so-called anchor probe, which is on the base, and a reporter probe at the top there that has something on it that we can detect. This, in this case, it's something called HRP, or horseradish peroxidase, which we can detect very easily. So we form a complex here, like three jigsaw pieces, and that complex only exists if the unique sequence of back, uh, DNA associated with the particular bacterium are in place. So hence, it's a very specific detector. The DNA is released within a few seconds in our micro system. This incubation process to form these complexes takes a few minutes. So we, we ideally should get a reading within about 10 minutes for our microwave-assisted DNA release. And it's very sensitive. We can detect over 10 million spores of bacteria per gram in, in, a, in a human sample. So you can see here that the, result, the, the, the results that we're getting in my lab will are actually applied in the medical area, and we're trying to develop technology based on known scientific principles that will actually improve living conditions in the 21st century and that's really what engineers are doing. They're making the world a better place to live. And they're taking fundamental, engineers take fundamental principles from the sciences and then apply them to the benefit of society. So um, I hope that that's at least um, sparked off a few questions and you found it interesting. As I said at the start, my name is Adrian Porch. Um, my email details are there. So if there's anything in this mini lecture that... Uh, raised a few questions or uh, general interest, then please drop me a line. Um, our students at Cardiff work in these areas because um, we have projects in these areas. And uh, so by coming to Cardiff University, you, you, you will get exposure to some of these techniques. And uh, anyway, I hope you found that useful. Thank you very much.